Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. We begin today mindful of livestock with guidance for producers managing cattle and caring for horses during some of Oklahoma's harshest conditions this winter. SUNUP's Curtis Hare starts the conversation today with our Extension Beef Cattle Specialist, Dave Lawman. Probably one of the most important principles is that cattle's uh, thermal neutral zone, which, which really just means the range and temperature in which they're comfortable is widely variable. And you can imagine, it's just common sense, you know, if an animal has a winter hair coat, a heavy winter hair coat, they can withstand a lot more cold. Uh, if an animal's hide is wet, they can't stand very much cold. I mean, they'll be stressed, cold stressed, if, they're, if their hide is wet, even if they do have a winter hair coat, because a, a wet coat doesn't do you any good. Let's say a cow has a dry, heavy, or she's dry, she has a heavy winter hair coat, down to 20 degrees or so, she's really comfortable. Things that, uh, you know, I think are just kind of practical ways to adjust to extreme conditions uh, are simply, uh, first of all, provide them with a place to get out of the wind. Uh, you know, and that can be natural cover in the trees or whatever, or, or a windbreak or some sort of a building. Uh, secondly, if there's an extended extreme uh, cold and wind in the winter time, you know, feed better quality hay. You know, their water requirements when it's cold are not as high, obviously, as they are in the summertime, but they still need to be able to drink. So if there's not snow on the ground and it's extremely cold, somebody needs to be responsible for cutting the ice if it's not a, you know, if it's not a rural water system or if it's not a, a, a moving stream. Well, so one thing you can do um, that, you know, may be an option for some people over an extended period of extremely cold and extremely windy conditions is put out some bedding. So unroll a bale of straw so the cattle can kind of get down in the straw and that provides a you know, considerable amount of, of relief from the wind. We're here with our extension equine specialist, Chris Heine. And Chris, we just spoke with Dave Lawman about cattle in winter. So let's move to horses. What are some things that producers need to think about with horses in winter? Sure, so most horses can tolerate winter pretty easily if you've allowed them to adapt to winter, essentially grow a winter hair coat, be out in the temperatures. Uh, and if the temperatures do drop pretty low, we do know that horses will need extra energy so that they can maintain their body temperature. So one thing that, they, that people do need to think about though is their, their water source. Um, talk a little bit about what they, uh, what, what are some things they do need to think about with that? Sure, so it's really important in the winter that horses maintain their water intake. And horses don't really like icy cold water, so they may actually drop their water intake in the winter, which can be uh, pretty negative as far as health effects. So we wanna make sure they always have fresh, open water. Um, a lot of people will use tank heaters or bucket heaters, but the big important thing with those is to make sure that there isn't any stray voltage. Horses are extremely sensitive to electricity and then it can almost learn to fear their water, which can be extremely detrimental. So one thing that we need to think about is older horses, our geriatric horses, as their teeth wear down, they actually may become more sensitive to cold. And so your older horses may actually drop their intake of water in the winter just because it doesn't feel very good. So um, while horses will adapt to the cold, um, producers do need to think about having shelter for horses, you know, out of the wind, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Horses need to have shelter from the wind and rain. Freezing rain on a horse can chill them really, really rapidly. So that's the ideal scenario is we have something that blocks wind and rain from them. Alrighty, thanks Chris. If you'd like some more information on cattle and horses in the winter, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Welcome to this December Mesonet weather report. Snow expectations last week were quickly squashed as the much forecasted storm took a more southerly track. It did, however, drop a little rain to Oklahoma, albeit not necessarily in the driest areas. Southeast Oklahoma received the most with Ida Bell topping the chart with 1.93 inches. The north half of the state, along with most of the southwest, continued the recent dry trend. This week, 
Wind seems to dominate the weather talk. Maximum wind gusts for December the 11th reached into the 40s, with Watonga hitting 47 miles per hour. When the cold front moves through on Thursday, we expect to see winds even higher, with gusts reaching into the 50s in western counties. Rainfall chances have been few and far between lately. There is, however, a reasonably good chance of precipitation for central into eastern Oklahoma as represented by this National Weather Service map. It goes through Monday, December the 17th. Hopefully, this storm will move some moisture into areas of the state where we need it the most, specifically the northeastern counties. After this storm, things look pretty dry, making the chances of a white Christmas very slim. Now here's Gary using that dreaded D word again, drought. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well let's revisit one of my least favorite but unfortunately most popular topics, drought. Now we know drought's a sneaky hazard and it can pop up when you least expect it. But if you look at the last 60 days, things are starting to look more and more interesting in Oklahoma. Let's get straight to the new drought monitor map and see what we have. Now since last week, unfortunately that D1 moderate drought up in northeast Oklahoma has started to spread just a little bit. Uh, the area covered by that drought is a little bit bigger. It's not a widespread area, but we do see that yellow area, which is D0, or abnormally dry conditions, has also spread to cover the entire northeastern corner of the state and also bleeding over into north central Oklahoma. Well, let's take a look and see what's happening on the Mesonet rainfall maps. Now last week we looked at the 30-day maps and unfortunately we've now extended that dry period into the 60-day maps. So the 60-day observed mesonet rainfall, we see very little rainfall up in north central Oklahoma. Uh, in fact, uh, Cherokee up in Alfalfa County has had less than an inch and less than two inches over much of northwest Oklahoma. That's the area we're looking for possible spread as we go in the next couple weeks if we don't get good rainfall. Now if we look at that as opposed to normal, over that same time frame, we can see much of north central, northwest Oklahoma, even down into central Oklahoma, is between two and uh, four to five inches below normal. So why don't we have widespread drought? Well, we are in the cool season and it's cooler than normal for this cool season so far. But also we go back to 90 days and we can see some pretty good rainfall surpluses uh, dating back to those periods. Uh, still, though, we see that uh, massive amount uh, of deficit up in the northeastern quadrant of the state. So we do need moisture across the entire state, but especially across northern Oklahoma, where we are in danger of seeing that drought intensify, despite the fact that it's the cool season. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Every year at this time, I think it's important to remind cow-calf producers across Oklahoma, those that have spring calving herds, that now's the time to consider changing our feeding pattern to where we're feeding the cows later in the day, as close to sunset as possible. And the reason that I like to suggest that is because the research is pretty clear on we can affect the timing of when those cows calve uh, when uh, calving time comes next late January, February, into March. The most recent, and I think the best study done yet on this particular su subject, was done by Kansas State University uh, folks at their Hayes Experiment Station in northern Kansas. And over a five-year period, they kept track of when calves were born in that particular cow herd the cows were all fed between 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. in the evening, and they were feeding some sorghum sudan hay as the primary source of the diet for those cows over that five-year period of time. They broke the daytime out into four-hour uh, increments for statistical purposes. And the, the bottom line was that 85%, again, of these cows calved between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m leaving only 15% between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. Uh, during the nighttime hours. The breakout was pretty interesting, I thought. The first four-hour increment from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m., 34% of the cows were calving. Between 10 a.m. and about 2 p.m., 21.2% of the cows calved, 
and then between 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. it was up to about 30 percent again of the cows that calved in that uh, particular uh, time frame. And so when you add all those together you come up with that 85 percent calving between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. There's just enough data on this subject to I think make this a pretty reliable practice that if we can somehow feed the cows in the very late afternoon, the last light of the day during these short winter days, then we'll have a higher percentage of the cows calve during day daylight hours. What some folks will do is uh, have the big round bales available in a closed lot where they just go out and open the gate, allow the cows access to the big round bales at uh, basically dinner time or supper time and then the following morning uh, move the cows back out of that uh, hay feeding area into their regular pasture. Even if the cows have total access 24-7 to big round bales by feeding the supplement just at uh, dusk seems to have a, a similar influence perhaps not as strong as what we've talked about where we've done it here at OSU where just the supplement was fed we had an indication of about 70 percent of the cows calving between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. So I think now's the time to start this late afternoon early evening feeding so that we have a high percentage of these cows calving when we're more likely to be there and provide assistance if necessary and more cows that are born when the sun's shining gives them a little better chance to warm up more quickly and be healthier jump up and nurse the, the cow get that colostrum that they need we hope you this will help you through this calving season look forward to visiting with you next week on sunups cow calf corner We've reached that time of year when herbicide application starts to slow down, so we decided that it would be a good idea to talk about herbicide mixing going into the spring. So Misha, there's a specific order that producers need to think about when they start mixing herbicide. Yeah, we just put out a fact sheet, kind of an updated version on a guideline that is uh, something that helps to follow when you're just not sure and you have a different products, herbicides, adjuvants that are going into your tank. Um, why do producer, producers need to think about that? What's some kind of the implications that would happen if you did just start mixing things in? Yeah, uh, two major concerns when we think about challenges. One, we can have interaction of some molecules form precip precipitates in the tank, clog lines, potentially ruin spray equipment. Um, so protecting our equipment and that investment. And then also we can have molecules, uh, different herbicides, adjuvants interact in a way that um, creates complexes that the weeds don't really like. So we don't get as good as a kill. Um, so equipment and then making sure we kill the weeds we want to kill. Um, so not all herbicides are the same and they all have different, you know, specific instructions when it comes to mixing. Talk a little bit about that and what producers need to keep in mind. Yeah. So when you look at a herbicide label, you're going to see active ingredients. Those active ingredients are what has toxicity to our weeds. They're formulated in a fashion that allows us as applicators to disperse them uniformly on plants and also to store them on shelves um, and that they don't decay. And so every herbicide has a different formulation um, and that's kind of what the guide outlines. If you have this kind of formulation, this is the timing that you should add it. Um, and you actually have a fact sheet out right now, uh, right now to um, kind of walk people through yes. whenever they're uh, just kind of a general um, guideline of mixtures. Uh, yes. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so the acronym, I guess kind of the traditional acro acronym has been WALES, W-A-L-E-S. And we've updated it a little bit to, I guess it would be a WAMELS, um, which I don't know, doesn't sound very catchy, but that's the order. Um, so we have, if you're adding ammonium sulfate, that will go in first. Um, if you're adding any kind of water dispersible products, those go in, that's the W. A is for agitation. Um, the M is for anything that's micro encapsulated. Then we add in our liquids and then we end with surfactants. Now, should people, should producers always follow this guideline specifically, or are there different ways that they can go about doing that? So it is a guide, um, so it won't answer every question we have. My number one recommendation would be to look to the herbicide label. Some herbicide labels will 
outline mixing order in an even more specific manner than we do in this guide. So herbicide label first. If there aren't much on the label to look to, then this can serve as a guide to use. Um, so it's just always best to follow instructions. Absolutely. Read <laughs> right. the label. All right. Thank you, Misha. If you would like a link to the, that fact sheet, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. The WASD came out earlier this week, and, and, and Kim, what was the markets like ahead of the report? Well, if you look at uh, expectations, you know, hard red winter wheat uh, exports were running about 36% below last year's level. The USDA November WASD had it down 3%, something had to give there. Also, Russian wheat exports were running well above expectations. Uh, and the market was looking for some adjustments in Russian export numbers. There were a lot of times you used the word expectations in there. Did the USDA report actually meet those expectations? I think they did. You look at uh, hard red winter wheat exports for the U.S., they lowered that from 360 million bushels down to 320. It's now 14 percent below last year's uh, projection or last year's exports. Uh, and our exports increased a little bit. So we're running, but rather than 36, we're about 31% below uh, last year's level. So we're just in there. They also raised uh, Russian exports, uh, 55 million bushels. Of course, now to do that, they raised Russian beginning stocks by about 37 and, and lowered Russian uh, ending stocks by about 19 million bushels. So with those adjustments in there, does that make it good or bad news? Well, yes, it does. Uh, there's a little bit of both in yeah. there. I think the uh, bad news is that uh, uh, hard red winter wheat exports for the U.S. are going to be lower than they were projected earlier. But uh, again, that's expectations. Uh, Russian uh, raising uh, the Russian uh, uh, beginning stocks of uh, 55 million bushels is more wheat than we thought they had. However, if you look at what's going on, uh, they they. <clears throat> The uh, Russian ending stocks were 436 million bushels last year. They're projected to be 197 million uh, at the end of this year. That's 239 million bushels Russia's not going to have to export in the 1920 marking year. And I think that's good news. Also, Russian uh, exports are well above average. If they keep up this pace, they're going to be through exporting in mid-February, and that's going to open the market for us. So that's the news around the world. Is, is that is that good news for Oklahoma ag producers? I think that's good news that our export demand should increase uh, increase late in the year. Mm -hmm. I think also the good news in those reports is that uh, the world is going to use more wheat this year than we produced last year. We've talked about it before. So all our quality wheat, we came into this last year short on protein. We're going to come into next year short on protein. The market is going to need a high quality protein wheat come June 1. And if we deliver it, we're going to get a good price for it. So putting all that effort, you know, in the last crop is starting to pay off for this crop and, and potentially the effort could pay off for the next one? I think so. And also, you know, you can put in there with the Russian ex, uh, any stock so low and their, the crop condition of their crop right now is, is not as good as it was last year. And there also some reports say they have less acres. If they lose a crop, we're primed and ready for six significantly higher prices. Okay, thank you much, Kim Anderson. Hopefully we open that present soon. <laughs> Kim Anderson, great marketing specialist here at Oklahoma State University. The one plant essential nutrient I talk about more than any other nutrient is nitrogen. And in my soil, soil fertility class, the students have to memorize the nitrogen cycle. So I'd take a little bit of time today to work through some of the components. So when you see me on sunup, talking about the nitrogen cycle, you have a better idea of what we're going through. So when the students are in class working on um, memorizing this nitrogen cycle, we go through a couple steps. One thing that we always start off with is the central component. So the central component is what everything operates around, and that for nitrogen is organic matter. We say organic matter is a central component because everything operates around it. In organic matter, there's a lot of nitrogen. So nitrogen coming out of organic matter can really contribute to the system. And nitrogen also goes into organic matter, removing it from the plant availability of the system. So also in the nitrogen cycle, so we have the one central component, we have three primary nitrogen sinks. So one of the nitrogen sinks is the nitrate pool, so NO3. This is the plant available pool that's sitting there where we have a big reserve of nitrogen. Up here up top, we have atmosphere. 
the atmosphere is a huge pool of nitrogen. Um, it contains a significant amount of uh, diatomic nitrogen, and so it is the largest pool that we have. The third pool, so remember one central component, three sinks, is the microbial and plant. So microbes and plants, living microbes and living plants contain a significant amount of nitrogen in them. So we have our one central component, three nitrogen sinks, then in addition to that, we also have our loss pathways. So we go one central component, three sinks, and now we have four loss pathways that all these students learn about. So we go from nitrate, with nitrate we have the leaching pathway. With leaching, that is water moving down and carrying nitrate with it. From nitrate, we have a couple other pathways. One here, we bring it up this way, and this one is our denitrification. Denitrification is when nitrate, <clears throat> when nitrate sitting there and the soil becomes anaerobic, or basically it has water, uh, it is sitting in water, so there's a lack of oxygen. The oxygen is pulled from nitrate and it turns into uh, nitrogen gas. And so we have a loss pathway going up this way of denitrification. We also have another pathway that's not just a loss, but we have nitrogen coming up here when we draw this out and nitrogen from nitrate turns into ammonium. The ammonium's taken up into the plant. So we have the ammonium into the plant as form of amino acids, but we have plant loss as one of our pathways. This is one of those loss pathways that a lot of people don't think about because the ammonia accumulating in a plant, when the conditions are hot and dry, that NH4 actually becomes toxic when the plant is lacking water. So the plant is drawing it down and it becomes ammonia. So the plants can gas off ammonia. In a hot, dry season at around flag leaf for winter wheat, if it gets really hot and really dry, we can lose an upwards of 20 to 30 pounds of ammonia gas through the leaf alone. So now we have one, two, three of our lost pathways over here we have another pathway that is ammonia loss. So this is actually NH4 or NH3 being volatilized. So ammonia volatilization. And that's our fourth pathway. To get there though, it's coming off of, we have NH4 setting right here uh, in the system. And in a hot, dry environment, NH4, when it's hot, when it's dry, that ammonia actually has a H stripped off of it and turned to NH3 gas. Now you ask, we got ammonia sitting out all over there. How do we get ammonia over there? So in this part of the nitrogen cycle, we have organic matter, have nitrogen as organic nitrogen, uh, which is our NH2, it's what we uh, look at as organic nitrogen. It's converted through a process called mineralization into NH4. Now when it's in the NH4 form, we can have it as uh, going up in the gas or being held onto the soil CEC. That is the, the exchange site. So I say ammonium NH4 is a immobile nutrient because it's positive, it's holding onto the negative cation exchange charge. So we have this organic matter going over there. Organic matter is also going into the nitrate pool. So through mineralization, we have nitrogen going nitrate, and we also have nitrate being converted back to organic matter. Now our plants and microbes are taking up nitrate into them systems. They're also taking up ammonium. So they're absorbing plants and microbes are eating ammonium or taking it up. And the plant and microbes, when they die, guess what? They go into organic matter. So now you're starting to see all this stuff start circle together. On this side, we still have to get this NH4 has one more loop that's going this way. So NH4 coming down, we have the conversion, we call it nitrification. That's when we turn NH4, that, that immobile nutrient, into nitrate and we use bacteria. Bacteria is used to do it, so bacteria is breaking down NH4 and turning NO3 through nitrification. Those bacteria, nitrosomus and nitrobacter, convert, they strip the uh, hydrogen off and basically add oxygen to it, turning it into nitrate. So we have our central component, our, our three pools, so we have our nitrate, microbial plant, and atmosphere, which we have our 
volatilization going up here. We also have the denitrification going in here, adding more nitrogen to the atmosphere. And of course, so we have everything in here. The one thing we have left is additions. So this additions to the system, not just due to the microbial plants dying, we have lightning and rainfall is contributing to the system. Every time it rains or every time it has lightning, we add nitrogen to the system. We also have the industrial fixation through, through uh, different um, manufacturing processes. We create nitrogen and have that in the system. Then of course we have fertilization. So farmers applying fertilizer to the soil adds nitrogen to the system. So this is kind of a brief rundown of the nitrogen cycle. And the importance to producers are, if you understand what is happening to nitrogen, either because of rainfall, because of cold weather, because of the addition or removal of organic matter, you have a better understanding of what's going on in the field, like what we saw this fall when we had so much rainfall occurring in much of our wheat ground. To see the full nitrogen cycle that my students have to reproduce in class on a blank sheet of paper, check out the SUNUP website at www.sunup.okstate.edu. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.